First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Kingsbury College, can I help you? Oh, hello. I'm ringing to find out about one of your courses. Yes. Is that a daytime or an evening course? Evening. Right. I'll just get a few details from you, if I may. Fine. Could I have your full name, first of all? It's Peter Wright. That's W-R-I-G-H-T. OK. And I don't need to know your exact age, but can you tell me which of these age groups you belong to? 18 to 25, 26 to 35... 36 to 45, or over 45? 18 to 25. Fine. And do you have a job, or are you a full-time student? I'm an accountant. I just do courses in my spare time for interest. OK. Right. And your address, Mr Wright? It's 11 Forest Road. F-O-R-E-S-T? Yes. Mm. Is that in Kingsbury? Yes, it is. I'm just down the road here. And do you have a phone number? It's 992-471. That's my home number. I haven't got a work number. That's fine. We probably won't need it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, you want to register for a course? Yes, cookery. Do you happen to know the exact title of the course? We've got Thai cookery on Wednesdays, or Mexican cookery on Fridays, or... Mexican. I'd like to do both, but I'm busy on Wednesdays. OK. Well, you can always do the other one next term, I suppose. Now, do you know when it begins? Is it the 26th of March? That's right. And it's £45 in total. That's including the ingredients. How would you like to pay? Card? Cash? Can I send a cheque? You can, yes. As long as it arrives at least one week before the start of the course. OK. And I'll just give you a reference number. If you could make a note of it and write it on the back. Yes. It's... CZ943. Yes, got that. Good. Well, there's just one last question. Do you have any special requirements that I should make a note of? Yes, there is one thing. I use a wheelchair. Right, so you need to have access for that. OK. Don't worry, your room is on the ground floor and I'll make sure there are no steps involved. We can always put a ramp in. Thanks. So, we look forward to seeing you on the 26th of March. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two flatmates, Tom and Richard, talking about their new flatmate who has just moved in the week before. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hi, Richard. I'm glad I caught you here. Can I just talk to you about something? Our new flatmate, Anders, is not quite what I had hoped. I was wondering if you shared my concerns about some of his behaviour. Uh, yes, Tom. I, I know what you mean, but we can't be entirely negative. He, he has good points. I mean, at least he's quiet. He doesn't play loud music all night or bother others or turn his TV up, disturbing everyone. Sure, he's quiet. But remember our last flatmate? He'd say hi to you and smile and treat everyone politely. In comparison, this new guy is very impolite. He just grunts in reply and sometimes ignores me altogether. I guess that's just his way. You know, just his character. I don't think he realises he's being impolite and it shouldn't matter to us too much. We can just ignore him too and quietly live our own lives. But his friends are hard to ignore when they visit. I know what you mean, but how often does that happen? I rarely see them, maybe once or twice a month. If they came more often, it might be a problem. But as it is, such rare visits don't matter so much. Wouldn't you say so? Well, I'm not sure, since it's very obvious when they're here because of all the cigarette smoke in the house. It stinks up the place, and you know we don't allow smoking on the premises. Well, I've never seen them doing this. Maybe they do it outside. Perhaps we can talk to Anders about it. Always remember, though, in one respect, he's a good tenant, and it's the most important aspect. The previous flatmate would always pay the rent late. I know what you're going to say. This guy pays promptly. But there's more to being a good tenant than prompt payment. I mean, you need to turn off the TV, clean up your dishes, dress respectably, be polite, and so on. I guess what I'm saying is that, basically, you need to cooperate with the others, and this new guy fails significantly in this respect. OK, I suppose you have a point there. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. I tell you what, Tom, why don't we talk to our new flatmate, Anders, about these issues? If we throw him out, we'll have to go to all the trouble of finding another flatmate, who might not necessarily be much better. So, let's give the current guy a chance. Here, I've got a piece of paper, so let's make a short list of issues to discuss with him. Get it out into the open. Sure, we'll give him one more chance. So, write communication. And let's tell him to... Well, we can't change a person's personality overnight. So why don't we have a weekly tenants meeting and we can just ask him to attend. That way we can get to know him better. I'll write attend meeting and we can take it from there. OK, but we have to tell him about his friends. They can't just do whatever they want. Write a heading friends and then write don't smoke anywhere inside or outside. Well... Instead of being so direct and possibly causing offence, I'll just write follow rules and verbally mention the rules. TV off by 10pm, no loud music or bad behaviour, including smoking. OK, do that, but I still think we need to specifically mention that last issue. You know how I can't stand the habit. So I'd like this to be another and separate point. Cigarettes, strictly forbidden. And it's important to include the strictly here. 
We can't pussyfoot around too much. Sometimes directness is necessary. Okay, I'll write that. Forbidden. Okay, and what about cleaning duties? Anders is a little too relaxed about that. Dishes are sometimes not washed. Dirty teacups are left around the place, and so on. So write must do better. Yeah, again, Tom. He might take that personally, and it could cause a scene. I'd rather be general. I'll write. Must be done, and I'll tell him that that's for everyone, not just him. Okay? Okay, as long as he gets the message. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear two university students discussing a social science lecture they attended. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Did you go to the first social science lecture yesterday? Yeah. Didn't you see me there? No. I was trying so hard to understand the lecturer. What didn't you understand? A lot of it, really. For example, he said we needed to study history as part of the course, but I didn't get why. You probably missed it. He said early on that we need to learn from our past mistakes. Right, but he also said we need to put ourselves in the place of our ancestors. Why is that? I think the point is that it's not enough to know how they lived and what they did. We need to know what they thought. I see, and I've written transferable skills in my notes next, but I have no idea what that means. If you study social science, you learn skills that you can use in a job. Oh right, is that all? Okay, but why is that? The point he made was that in studying social science, you use a flexible and adaptable approach to learning. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. He also kept mentioning all the other subjects we will need to study as part of the course. I didn't write them all down. Did you? Some of them. I think I can make sense of my notes. The first one was anthropology, which he said would cover prehistory and archaeology as well. Okay. Then there's economics. I wrote down that this was not meant to mean that we will spend all our time looking at economic theory, but more that we need to see how humans behave. That's good. I don't think I could handle economic theory. He said something about education too, didn't he? Yeah, he said we'll be looking at how cultural information is handed down from one generation to the next through teaching children. He said we'd be focusing on geography too, but I can't really remember which aspects. Can you? I noted it down. I think. Here we are. Yes, 
particularly in relation to urban planning. It's law that I got confused about. I didn't understand why he linked that to economics. I think he meant that laws affect the way wealth is distributed. That makes sense. Now, what are the science wars? Okay, I did get that. The science wars are about how social science collects information. In sociology and social work, and in social science generally, they can only study patterns of behavior and observe. If you compare that to the way scientists work in physics or chemistry, it's very different because they use specific experiments that can be tested and which give concrete answers. Social studies is often accused of being unscientific. That's all. Okay, but it still looks like a good course, doesn't it? You don't have any regrets, do you? None at all. I'm looking forward to it. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. <clears throat> Last week we looked at some of the features of modern houses, and today we're going to turn the clock back and look at traditional house design. I've chosen to start with Samoa, which is part of a group of Polynesian islands in the South Pacific Sea, because the influence of culture and weather on house design is quite clear there.、Um, so let's have a look at first of all at the overall design of a traditional Samoan house. Now, these days, houses in Samoa have become more modern and are usually rectangular. But traditional designs were round, or sometimes they were oval in shape. Here's a picture. This traditional style is still used, often for guest houses or meeting houses, and most Samoan villages have at least one of these buildings. As you can see, there are no walls, so the air circulates freely around the house. Samoa is a place that experiences high temperatures, but the open design of the house also reflects the openness of Samoan society. If the occupants want shelter, there are several blinds made of coconut leaves that can be lowered during rainy or windy weather. Or indeed, the blinds can also be pulled down if people want some privacy. The foundations of the house—that's <clears throat> the part beneath the floor—are raised slightly.、Um, in the past, the height was linked to the importance of the occupants, which we'll talk about another time. However, the floor of the house was usually covered with river stones. 
Today, we have a range of methods for balancing the temperature inside a building, but the stones on the floor of a Samoan home are ideal for cooling the building on hot days. Now, let's have a close look at the roof. This, as you can see in the picture, is dome-shaped and traditionally thatched or covered with leaves from the sugarcane. That's an established crop in Samoa. This was a job for the women and it involved twisting the leaves and then fastening them with a thin strip of coconut leaf before fixing them to the roof in several layers. Now, the shape of the roof is important. You can see that the sides are quite steep and that's done so that the rain falls straight to the ground without moisture going through the leaves and causing leaks or dampness inside the house. Then you'll notice how high the top of the roof is. This is a way of allowing heat to rise on sunny days and go through the thatching, thereby cooling the house. So, how does the house stay upright? Well, there are a number of evenly spaced posts inside. They, um, they encircle the interior of the building and go up to the roof and support the beams there. They're also buried, uh, usually about a metre and a half in the ground to keep them firm. These posts are produced using local timber from the surrounding forests. They're cut by men from the family or village, and the number varies depending on the size and importance of the house. Now, these posts were a very significant part of Samoan culture and did much more than hold up the roof. When there were meetings, people sat with their back to certain posts, depending on their status in society. So there were posts for chiefs, according to their status, and posts for speakers, and so on. And ordinary people sat around the side on mats. The last area I want to look at today is the attachment of the beams and posts, what you call fixing the construction. Traditionally, no nails or screws were used anywhere in such a building. Instead, coconut fibres were braided into rope to fix the beams and posts together. The old people of the village usually made and plaited the rope. This was a lengthy process. An ordinary house used about 40,000 feet of this rope. And as you can see in this picture... The rope was pulled very tightly and wound round the beams and posts in a complex pattern. And in fact, the process of tying it to the beams so that it was tight and strong enough to keep them together is one of the great architectural achievements of Polynesia. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute 